Greetings everybody and today we're going to be evaluating this definite integral running from minus 1 to 1 of the square root of 1 minus x squared divided by 1 plus x squared. So this is another one of those dog bone contour examples that I've done a couple times in this channel already and yeah this integral specifically was requested by one of my viewers and I also saw it on a stack exchange as well and it's a pretty nice example where you have to be careful with branch cuts and whatnot um, but yeah let's just jump straight into the solution I'll assume that um, most of the people watching are familiar with dog bone integration and whatsoever. If you want more details, then you can check out my other videos on similar integrals with the branch cuts and all that. Um, but yeah, let's just jump straight into it. So we're going to let some new complex function f of z. And I'm going to let this equal to 1 plus z to the 1 half and 1 minus z to the 1 half divided by 1 plus z squared. So I hope you can see where this is coming from. Um, 1 minus x squared, you can do difference of perfect, perfect squares and you get 1 plus z, 1 minus z. And of course I'm changing the x's to z's. Um, just note though that these two functions aren't necessarily the same in the complex plane um, because of different arguments and whatnot. But on the interval minus 1 to 1, the values do in fact coincide. So that's why we use this function um, and if we integrate along certain paths, it's going to recover our original integral, which I will call i as well. So this is our function, and just notes that we have some poles and branch cuts. The poles come from this denominator, so poles, it's plus or minus i, and the branch cuts, or the branch points, I think I said branch cuts before, branch points I meant, they're going to be plus or minus one. Because if you take a look at these factors, they have fractional powers. And whenever you have fractional powers, you have um, branch cuts and the branch points are just wherever the insides are equal to zero. So Z equals negative one here, and Z equals positive one for this factor. Okay, now what I'll also do is let's just let a new function G of Z um, this is just something we'll study temporarily to just be the numerator because that's where all the branch cuts are happening and the branch cuts are what we want to study. So we have just the numerator here and what I want to do is I want to rewrite g in polar form. Um, the reason being is we want to study how the argument changes as we approach above and below different branch cuts and whatnot. So how do we write this in polar form? Well, I'm going to rewrite each of these factors or I'm going to put them into e to the natural log. So we're going to have e um, and this half power can stay up here. Then we're going to have a log of one plus z. And then we also have e to the one half log of one minus z. Now, how to take logarithms of complex numbers? Well, it's just the log of the magnitude um, plus i times the argument. So we can write this as e to the one half log of the magnitude or absolute value then plus i times the argument of one plus z and then same over here we have e to the one half log of the magnitude and then we have a plus i times the arg of the inside so plus one half i argument of one minus z in this case so this is what we have Notice we can split up these exponentials as well using exponential properties and yeah, these two factors right over here um, they collapse back down into just 1 plus z to the 1 half and then 1 minus z to the 1 half and then we have e so these two remaining factors we can factor out 1 half times i or write as i times 1 half then we're going to have arg of 1 plus z plus the arguments of one minus z. So in particular, the arguments of our function, so if we imagine decomposing a function into polar form, the arguments of f, um, that's just this angle in here. So that's going to be one half, and then we have the arguments of one plus z, and then plus the arguments of one minus z. So this will be important later on when we study the branch cuts and so on. Um, but let's just draw it a little bit of a picture of what we have so far. So we have poles and branch cuts, poles at minus i and positive i. So this is i and minus i. And we have branch points at 1 and negative 1, like so. Now, we're going to have branch cuts coming out of these branch points that can be oriented in any direction we want them to be in. 
Um, however, what's the most useful one for this particular integral? Well, it would be if both of them were along the, the real axis. In particular, we're going to arrange for both of them to point along the negative real axis because what's going to happen is the two branches that overlap over here, they're actually going to cancel. So our function will be nice and continuous across this um, negative portion, leaving us with just one branch cut right in the middle. So there's kind of like a slit in the complex plane. So this is something we want to prove now. Um, so let's get rid of all this stuff with a G of Z. You don't really need that stuff anymore. We only need the arguments that we found over there. So um, how do we get both of these branch cuts to lie on the negative real axis? Well, we have to define them. So we're going to uh, let... Well, first of all, there's two arguments. It's arg1 plus z and 1 minus z. So we're going to let arg1 plus z. Um, now, which one is that associated to? Well, it's the branch cuts coming out of minus 1. Now, this is along the negative real axis, so uh, it makes sense to define this on the interval minus pi up to pi. Um, however, the arg of 1 minus z, well, that's the branch cut coming out of positive 1. You might say, well, that's minus pi to pi as well. Um, not quite, because we have a reflection in z. Um, not really a re reflection. We have this negative. But in the complex plane, you should think about negatives as rotations by pi radians. So really, we want the branch cuts um, to be pointing in the positive direction, um, so to the right, but because we have this reflection, it's going to kind of reflect back to the negative real axis. Um, so we originally want this to be on 0 to 2 pi. However, in the z plane, since we have the negative, it's going to rotate back over. So this is how we're going to define our arguments. Now, the thing is, we want to figure out what the argument of f will approach above and below the branch cuts, because that's going to help us calculate some integrals. Um, also, another thing we need to check is for continuity across the interval minus infinity to minus 1. Um, so all the modular stuff that we had before, that's going to be continuous. The only thing we need to check that's going to be continuous is the argument over here. We don't know that. That's why we need to check it. So I'm going to draw out a little bit of a table that I usually do. So I think it's four columns. So we're going to have, we're going to study the argument on the interval minus one to one, but approaching from above and also approaching from below and also on the interval minus infinity to minus one approaching from above and the minus infinity to minus one, but we approach from below. So we're going to calculate arg of what do we have? We have one um, plus z first, and then we have arg of 1 minus z, and then in the end we're going to try to calculate the arg of f. But that's just taking one half times the sum of these two args, so kind of like taking the average in this case. So let's take a look at arg of 1 plus z first, because that's the easy one, we don't have reflections. So arg of 1 plus z, we want to imagine ourselves centered on the branch point minus 1. And we ask ourselves the question, well, if we're standing over here, what does the argument approach as we um, come from minus one or this interval from above? Well, it's going to approach an angle of exactly zero and zero is on the interval minus pi to pi. And from below, it's going to approach the same thing as well. On the interval minus infinity to minus one, if we approach from above, if we're standing over here, it's going to look like we're approaching pi and then from below, it's going to be minus pi. Now, as for arg of 1 minus z, this is a little bit more tricky to do. You'll have to imagine rotating this a little bit. So, you look at this picture upside down. Rotate your um, monitor or your phone, if you're watching it on a phone. Um, yeah, rotate whatever you're watching um, 180 degrees and imagine yourself centered at 1. Um, so, we want to ask ourselves, well, if we're standing at 1, what does the argument approach as we approach the interval minus one to one from above. Well, imagine this is rotated. If we're coming from this direction, then it's actually looking like it's approaching an angle of two pi. So two pi, if we approach from above, and if we're approaching from below, well, rotate your head 180 degrees, it's going to look like we're approaching an angle of zero. And so on the interval minus infinity to minus one, um, it's on the same side of this branch point. So we're going to get the exact same values of two pi and zero. 
So these are all the arguments calculated. Let's try to figure out arg of f, but that's just taking the average of these two. So the average of zero and two pi is pi. The average of two zeros is zero. The average of pi and two pi, well, that's going to be three pi on two, but three pi on two is the same as negative pi on two, it's congruent mod two pi. So we can just write minus pi on two here. And the average of minus pi and zero is also minus pi on two. And the nice thing is these two arguments over here, they coincide, which means that it doesn't matter if we approach above or below on the interval minus infinity to minus one, the arguments are going to be the same. Hence our function is nice and continuous there. However, on the interval minus one to one, we're going to get different angles. So if we approach from above, we're actually going to get an angle of pi. However, if we approach from below, we get an angle of zero. So in other words, the arguments is different. So these two values over here, they're not congruent mod two pi. We're going to get a little discontinuity on the interval minus one to one. Okay, so that's all the argument stuff out of the way. Next, we're going to construct our contour. And our contour is just gonna be a dog bone contour. So we're integrating from minus one to one. So we want, I guess, two path integrals that come from above and below. So just above and below the branch cuts. And we're gonna do a little loopy loop around these branch points um, to kind of connect it all up. So we're gonna call the path above psi one, the path below psi two, and let's call the little circle paths um, gamma minus one and the gamma one as well. So what do we have? We have that the contour integral over C, which is this whole entire contour, um, can be written as well. I'm going to write this down um, over here because I'll write other stuff later. Um, this is equal to the integral over psi one, plus the integral over psi two, plus the integral over gamma one, uh, or gamma minus one, and then plus the integral over one. Okay, so the idea is um, these two integrals over gamma negative one and gamma plus one, they are encircling branch points. And the idea is we're going to kind of shrink this contour in um, into this branch cut, and as we do so, if we're integrating around branch points, these are going to go to zero. So this is something that you can check quite easily just by doing a little parameterization with um, one plus epsilon e to the i theta, or minus one plus epsilon e to the i theta. And yeah, taking the limit, it's really quite clear. You can check out my other videos on that if you want to see um, how that works, but it's not too tricky to show. Um, and the integrals, on psi one and psi two are actually going to recover i in some way because they're basically going along the, the interval minus one to one. Okay, and the contour integral over c, we really don't know how to work that out. We can't use Cauchy's theorem or anything like that. Um, so yeah, the contour integral over c, we really don't know how to evaluate that. So we have two integrals over here, which are going to help us evaluate i. Um, so what else can we use? Because in the end, these are just going to have some factor of i in them. It's going to be equal to something we don't know. Um, well, let's use these poles in some way. So remember the contours, they can be deformed. So we can imagine blowing up our contour C. Um, so imagine this is kind of like a balloon or something, you blow it up, but it can't cross these poles or anything. So if you blow the sky up, what will the picture look like? Well, we're still gonna have these poles, that's i and um, minus i. And we still have the little branch cuts right in the middle here from minus one to one. Um, however, if you blow it up, hopefully you get a picture that looks something like this. This is what happens when you blow it up. But the nice thing is, since our function is nice and holomorphic everywhere, except for the branch points, branch cuts and the poles, um, these two regions over here, if we make them close in on each other, um, they're actually going to, the integrals along those paths are actually going to cancel each other out. So we can basically seal in the paths over here, like so, and creates little circles going around these poles. So our contour, by the way, it's going in the positive direction. Um, usually we always go in the positive direction. Um, so out here, it's also gonna go in the positive direction. So it's gonna go up and then in, and on these little circles that go around the poles, 
they're actually going to go in the negative direction, so they're going to be clockwise. Okay, so what do we notice? Well, all these path integrals, they're basically C once again. Um, however, let's call this path up here gamma, and little circle paths, let's call them gamma, um, let's say this would be, I think, I, but this is going in the negative direction, so I'm go also going to indicate with a negative sign, and then this is gamma minus I also in the negative direction. So we've sh basically shown or observed that all these integrals over here, the contour integral over C, can also be decomposed in this way. We can also write it as the integral over big gamma plus the integral over gamma around minus I in the negative direction, and then plus the integral over gamma I also in the negative direction. So we have these qualities of integrals, I guess. So these two integrals, psi1 and psi2, they help us evaluate our integral i. And so these three integrals we have to evaluate in some way. Now the integral over um, gamma, um, you may think, well, this is along a big circle, taking the limit as the radius approaches infinity. Um, this is probably going to go to um, zero. But it's actually not in this case. And I think a nice way you can used to tell if the integral over gamma goes to zero or not, um, is by looking at the integrands. Notice that the numerator decays, not decays, it goes as, um, what would it be, just x, as x goes to infinity, and the denominator goes as x squared. Um, so the whole entire integrands as a whole, uh, it's asymptotically equal to one over x. Now, if your integrand is asymptotically equal to one over x, um, you're going to pick up some residue on this integral over gamma, in particular the residue at infinity. So the integral over gamma um, won't decay, we have to use the residue at infinity there. Then these two integrals, um, those are going to be little integrals or paths around these poles, of course, so we're going to have residues to evaluate. So that's the idea so far. Let's start calculating some integrals. I don't think we need any of this stuff anymore. Let's clean up the board a little bit. So let's start off by taking a look at the integral over psi 1 and psi 2. Um, let's put this over here. So the integral over psi 1, what is that going to be? Well, I've used this lemma um, many times when I deal with branch cuts. Um, essentially, what you can do, so if this is the integral of a function f of z, then you can decompose f into its polar form, you could say. Um, so this would be something like the integral over psi 1 of absolute value of f and then e to the i argument of f but along this path of psi 1. Because remember, the argument of f is different depending on if we approach from above or below, so this is something we have to be careful about, dz. Now this e to the i arg, that is the constant with respect to z, so this just jumps out um, and this leaves us with e to the i arg of f, but depending on well, which way we approach it from. So this is going to be on psi 1. And then we integrate on psi 1 of the absolute value of f. But the integral on psi 1, in the limit we're making this approach to the branch cut, so that's going to approach the interval minus, um, or sorry, 1 to minus 1. So this is going to go to 1 to minus 1 of the absolute value of f of z. Um, we could keep z or could change it to x's, it really doesn't matter, let's just do x's, and then dx. Now we're taking the absolute value of the function f of x here, um, but notice if you take the magnitude or the absolute value of everything in here, you're basically going to recover the integrands because the integrands, you can check, it's always positive. So in fact, this whole integral over here, well, it's off by a negative factor because we want to go from minus one to one. So what we can do is put a negative out here and flip the bounds. And now this whole entire integral is going to evaluate to i. The question is now, what is e to the arg f of yeah, f alongside one? Well, it's just going to be this pi. So this is going to be minus e to the i um, and the arg is going to approach, yeah, just pi. And then we have i, of course. Now, e to the i pi, that's negative 1, so negative out here as well, that's going to cancel, leaving us with i. So the integral along psi 1 is going to recover exactly our i, which is nice. 
Now, how about the integral along side two? Well, in the same fashion, um, integral along side two, what we do is we take a look at e to the i argument of our function, um, but along the path psi two, and then we integrate, well, psi two, it's going to go from minus one to one of the absolute value of our function. However, this guy, that's exactly i, as we discussed before, and the argument, what does that approach? If we go from below, it's going to approach zero. So this is going to be e to the i zero. Um, so that's just going to be i because this exponential function will turn out to be one. So one times i is i. So the integral alongside two is also going to evaluate to i. So that's the left-hand side of this equation done. Let's try to figure out the right-hand side now. So the right-hand side, let's start off with say the integral over gamma. So integral over gamma of f of z, dz. Well, we have to use the residue at infinity. Now, the residue at infinity, it's defined for a contour going clockwise. This is going anti-clockwise. So we'll just stick an extra negative sign out here to compensate for that. And then we're going to have 2 pi i times the residue at infinity of a function f of z. So let's just directly plug in the definition of the residue at infinity. It's simply going to be the residue at z equals zero of one over z squared with a negative, and then we have f of one over z. These negatives over here, they're going to cancel essentially, and this leaves us with two pi i times the residue at z equals zero of one over z squared. Now our function, we're going to plug in one over z. So that's going to give us something like one plus one over z to the one half, then one minus one over z to the one half. Then all of this is divided by one plus one over z squared. Okay, so this is two pi i residue at z equals zero of, we can say distribute the z into everything in the denominator, and that gives us um, z squared plus one. And in these linear factors here, well, we're going to, instead of one, we're going to write that as z divided by z so we can combine the fractions together. And that overall leaves us with something like z um, plus one to the one half and divided by z to the one half, um, then z minus one to the one half divided by z to the one half, but notice z to one half and z to the one half, that's just an overall z. So this is two pi i residue, z equals zero of one over z times z plus one to the one half, z minus one to the one half divided by z squared plus one. Okay, so that's a lot of algebra so far. Let's use the definition of the limits. So you can see that this is a simple pole because we just have one over z. So what would that look like? It's two pi i limits as z approaches zero of z minus the pole, which in this case is just z, times whatever we have over here. Um, but the nice thing is that z and one over z will cancel, so we can forget about this. And we're left with z plus one to the one half, z minus one to the one half, divided by z squared plus one. Okay, but as z approaches zero, then the denominator, that just becomes one, essentially. And so we're left with two pi i. Then on this first factor, we're going to get one to the one half, so square root of one, but that's just one. And on the second factor, we're going to get negative one to the one half. So one to the one half, that's clear, that's just one, so we have two pi i. Now minus one to the one half, you may be tempted to say, well, that's just i, isn't it? Um, because this is just square root of one, but not quite because you have to be careful about the branches. You see, this one half power, this is coming from this factor, and if you trace it all the way back, we have to use the argument um, of one minus z. So to evaluate this properly, and we'll put it over here, we have minus one to the one half. You want to write this in terms of the logarithm. So we have e to the one half log of minus one. But remember how do you eva evaluate logarithms of um, complex numbers? Well, it's e to the one half logarithm of the magnitude, and then you have plus 
i times the arguments of minus one. So this is why we have to be careful about argument. It's because this arguments over here, we're actually using this arguments because it comes from the logarithm of one minus z. So log of one, that's um, simple, that's a zero, so that's gone. So we're left with e to the i, one half. Now the question is, what is arg of minus one? Well, on this interval, it's just going to be, well, pi. So this is pi, I guess. Okay, so e to the i, one half pi, that should just be something like um, a minus, um, not minus, just, just i. So this was in fact i, I was thinking of something else before. So yeah, 2 pi i times i, so this is minus 2 pi. So yeah, in general, minus 1 to the 1 half isn't equal to i, you have to check the branches over here. So for instance, if this one half that was referencing this argument, um, then that would probably work out in some other way. I'm not too sure. Um, but yeah, you have to check the branches every time you evaluate things with fractional powers. Okay, so what do we have so far? The integral over gamma evaluates to minus two pi. Um, and if you have these two integrals left, let's go ahead and do them, hopefully it's not too tricky to do. So what do we have? We have the integral over gamma minus i and then in the negative direction. Okay, so what is this going to evaluate to? This is in the negative direction, so let's compensate for that by putting a negative. Then we have two pi i residue, that's z equals minus i of our function. So this is, yeah, whatever, this is over here. Um, now, this is just a simple pole. You can clearly see that because we have a quadratic, then this splits up into linear factors. Um, so what we can write is 2 pi i limits as z approaches minus i of z minus the pole, which is just z plus i, times the function, which is 1 plus z to the 1 half, then 1 minus z to the 1 half, and that denominator, we can split it into linear factors, so that's going to be something like z plus i and z minus i. These factors cancel, and let's take the limit. So this is, um, yeah, if we take the limit, this is going to be 1 minus i to the 1 half, then 1 plus i to the 1 half, divided by, if you plug a minus i into here, well, that's just going to be minus 2i. Okay, so negatives, negatives, cancel, these twos cancel, these i's cancel, and we're left with pi, and now we have to evaluate these guys over here. Um, now, how to evaluate these? Well, again, you can't just, well, we're doing fractional powers over here, so you have to use the logarithm. So we have, first of all, e to the one half log of one minus i, then e to the one half log of one plus i. And now we have to use the definition of complex logarithm. So this is pi. Then we have e, one half logarithm of the magnitude. So this is um, square root of two, I believe. So log of root two. And then you also have to add on i, so one half because we expand. So you add on i times the arguments of one minus i. And then you do the same thing over here. We're going to get e, to the one half logarithm of the magnitude, which is again root two, then plus one half times i times the argument of one plus i. Okay, now we have two arguments over here. We have to be careful they're not on the principal branches or anything. Um, this first argument, we have to take in this domain because this is coming from which factor was it? It was the one plus z. So we have to take the arg of one plus z, which is on minus pi to pi. Um, so yeah, this guy over here is on the interval minus pi to pi. Whereas this argument over here, that came from, well, this guy, arg of one minus z. So on the interval zero to two pi. So this is zero to two pi. Um, so what is this going to be equal to? This is pi. Then e to the log that cancels, this leaves us with um, something like root 2 raised to the 1 half. And then we have e 
to the i times one half, then the question is what is arg of one minus i? Well, if you take a look at the arg in plane, one minus i is down here somewhere, and we're on the interval minus pi to pi, which means the argument must be minus pi on four. So this is, yeah, minus pi on four. Then we can do the same thing over here. We have square root of two to the one half because of this log and this e. Then we have e to the i times the one half. And then we have arg of one plus i, but one plus i that's up over here, we're on the interval zero to two pi. So that's going to be the argument. Um, yeah, the argument is going to be pi on four. Okay, so the nice thing is over here, we have minus pi and four and positive pi and four. And so if you multiply these two exponentials together, they're basically going to cancel. So this leaves us with pi. Then we have two to the one and a half times root two to the one and a half. Overall, that's square root of two. So this integral over gamma negative i is going to evaluate to pi, then square root of two. Okay, and we can repeat uh, repeat the same thing for gamma around i. So let's do that replacement now. It's going to be pretty similar. So let's try to go through this quickly. So we still have this negative sign because it's going in the positive direction. Um, so now what do we have? We have a minus two pi i limit as z approaches. Um, that's going to be positive i actually. So z approaches i of z minus i times our function, which is one plus z to the one half, one minus z to the one half, divided by, um, that's going to be one, or sorry, we can factor that to z minus i, and then z plus i. These factors are going to cancel, leaving us with z plus i down here. So taking the limit, we're going to get one plus i to the one half, one minus i to the one half, divided by two i. These two, and yeah, these two i and two i down here will cancel, leaving us with minus pi. Again, these fractional powers we have to rewrite as logs, um, but we can kind of skip the modulus part because we already know that that's root two to the one half, root two to the one half from this guy. And then we have e to the i one half, arguments of one plus i for this first factor, then also e to the i one half arg of one minus i for the second factor. So the argument of this guy over here, that's going to be minus pi to pi. And the argument of the second guy is going to be on the interval zero to two pi. Okay, so we have minus pi. Um, these two, uh, yeah, these two root twos to the one and a half, they're going to simplify down to just square root of two. Um, then we have e to the i one half, arg of one plus i on the interval minus pi to pi. Um, well, that is going to be one qu quarter or pi and four. Then on this interval, we have e to the i one half, one minus i, that's somewhere down here. And on the interval zero to two pi, the argument is seven pi and four. So we have times seven pi over four. Okay, so overall what do we have? We have pi, square root of two, then we have e to the i pi over eight, then e to the i, and this is going to give us seven pi over eight. Now if you add the two angles over here, because yeah, we're multiplying these two exponential functions, we're going to get e to the i one pi. Um, so yeah, this is e to the i pi, but e to the i pi is equal to minus one. So we have negative and negative, which cancels, and this also leaves us with pi square root of two. So the contribution from this integral is also pi root two. And we're basically almost done. We've evaluated all the integrals, and now it's time to put everything together. So what do we have? We have two i, and this is equal to minus two pi plus two times the square root of two times pi. Okay, we can divide both sides by two, which leaves us with i is equal to um, minus pi, then we have plus root two pi. And we can factor this a little bit. Let's factor out, for example, pi, and this leaves us with square root of two minus one. 
and this is the final answer for our integral. It's a pretty standard um, dog bone contour integral. Um, yeah, just have to be careful with the arguments and so on and seeing which branches they lie on. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much all for this video. If you guys have any other integral suggestions you want me to do on this channel, then feel free to comment or yeah, just send me an email. You can find my email in the about section on my channel. Uh, but yeah, that's all for today. Hope you guys enjoyed and I'll see everyone in the next one. Bye bye.